Hi guys, I just thought I'd better do uh, some recordings, I need a microphone, um, of, uh, oh, what's on it? recording of uh, a couple of these, this is a theory we've been talking about recently, or about to talk about, hopefully you're enjoying a lovely long weekend, cloudy but relaxing. Okay, so last week we started talking about inheritance patterns, and so I'll just quickly revise that one for you, and then have a look at what we're looking at in these last two weeks of term. So, if I go down there, um, you'll be quite aware of things like pedigrees, and pedigrees are used to show how a trait may flow through a family. And we went through all these little symbols the other day in class. So squares are used to show males and circles females. Um, and you can see the square with a line joined to a female shows that a couple are mating, if it's animals, so I suppose, uh, you know, married, if you like. And then we have uh, a little pair showing children. We can have dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins. Of course, monozygotic twins we also talk about as being identical. And so in this little diagram here, they've got that bit wrong. I've stolen this off the web. Um, and we should have the same sex, of course, because they are identical. Essentially, what we're concerned about is on the right-hand side towards the bottom of the diagram. And that's how a pedigree gets laid out. So we have the first generation, or the, the parent generation, and then the second generation, given, um, and we use, for each generation we use the Roman numerals, and then each person within a generation is numbered from one to two, working left to right. So we've got our parents in the first generation, we call them one, one, and one, two. And then they've had three children, they're 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. And 2, 2 and 1, 2 are showing a, a condition. We don't know what that is yet, but it could be a recessive trait for um, uh, small ears or something. You know, or, or in my case, inability to roll my tongue, as we discussed in class, and you enjoyed poking your tongues at me. Um, so then we create these sort of things when we're studying a particular trait. And it's always worth sort of looking at for how we can tell what's going on. If we're talking autosomal, we, we're talking about those genes that aren't found on the sex chromosomes. And we'll talk sex in a minute. Um, if it's recessive, then um, the allele, the recessive allele is masked by the effects of the dominant allele. And so in this particular pedigree here, we have four generations. Unfortunately, they're not numbered, but we've got one, two, three, four generations, um, and we've got people marrying into the family and producing offspring. This is a recessive trait because we can see how it's actually jumped two generations. So the first parent, the mother in the first generation, has this condition. Um, let's say it's red hair. I'll do something different instead of big noses. Um, and she's had three children with her partner, but all those three children lack red hair. So he may well have dark hair, and his dark hair gene, the allele for it, is being passed on to all his children. His wife's red-haired allele is being passed on to all three children, but the dark hair masks that, uh, that red hair. The third son marries a woman without red hair, and they have two daughters, again, without red hair, and she marries someone without red hair. And all of a sudden, we have two children in that last generation, showing red hair, and a boy and a girl. So that suggests to us it's not sex-linked, it's autosomal, it's on those first 44 chromosomes. Um, and we can see how it's skipped two generations to turn up again, which suggests that both the mother and the father must be carrying that allele for red hair, but not showing it. And so they've passed that particular allele on to the first son and the first daughter. Whereas the second son and third daughter have missed out completely. Oh, sorry, <laughs> second son, third son, have missed out completely. We can also see um, patterns known as autosomal dominant. So again, these are on chromosomes one to forty-four. They're genes found there. Uh, in this case, the genotypes have been written in the big A, little a. That's our genotype. Uh, in this case, we're seeing how all three generations in the family are showing the condition. And in fact, all the people with it we would call carriers because they've only got one allele for it. They're not they're heterozygous, not homozygous. Um, and the 
other individuals in the family are homozygous recessive, they've only got one type of allele. And we're seeing again, there's a pattern where both males and females are showing a condition, so we know this is not going to be sex linked. But plenty of individuals, plenty of mixture. Um, then we can talk about things being sex linked. This way gets a little bit more interesting, a little bit more difficult. Um, so you can have conditions on the X chromosome and you can have conditions on the Y chromosome. Now the Y chromosome is only a very short chromosome with a handful of genes and those genes have passed from father to son and never, well, we won't say never because it's not quite true. We'll talk about mutations soon. But uh, generally it doesn't go to the daughter at all. So we're seeing, this, in this case, we're looking at a classic colour blindness. So the red-green colour blindness is known to be sex-linked. Um, and we see here how we've got a mother who has the uh, normal gene for ice colour, big B. The allele of that gene is normal and dominant. And her other allele is recessive and gives red-green red colour blindness. She's married a man with red green, green colour blindness and his ex is carrying that recessive allele and of course his Y doesn't have the, an allele because it hasn't got that gene. So he passes his little B to both of his daughters. The first daughter, or potential daughter, has a big B little B, so she's going to be like mum. She's not going to be red green colour blind, but she has the ability to pass it on to her children. The um, second child, the second female child, X little b, X little b has received the allele for red green colour blindness from both parents and is therefore red green colour blind and quite unusual for females to actually see it because they do need both alleles to be little b. And then in the males we've got one who hasn't got it because mum's given him her big b and the really most common um, form of red green, green colour blindness is found in males because the mother passes on her unknown allele for red green colour blindness and of course dad gives the son is why. Um, this is what we call sex linkage. So um, I think I've just talked about that, haven't I? Fathers always pass their traits to their daughters because they have to pass their ex to their daughter. Um, and of course, uh, mothers can, will pass half of theirs to their sons and half to their daughters. And daughter must have two X chromosomes, so less chance of showing the condition. Widely chromosomes, there are a handful of um, of, 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 of genes on the Y chromosome, as it says here, that they're essentially to do with male fertility and sex determination, so being male. Um, and of course, there's a past father to, fa father to son. So if you're looking at an X linked recessive inheritance, like this particular uh, pedigree here, 1 1 is the, um, the father with a condition. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to call that because they have big noses. I like big noses. Uh, and then his grandson, 3-2, also shows that condition. So the, the pattern shows how it's trapped, if you like, within one gender, and most commonly the males, because the males only need one copy of the allele. And it's jumping generation, as you expect with most recessive inheritance patterns. So they're all indicators of what might happen. Then I've actually loaded the dice here when I made this, so I should go back and actually change this off. I've made this really obvious. Um, if it's X linked dominant, then all the males get it. Now, of course, the reality is some of those females would have it too because there's just so much of it going around. But um, you need only one allele because it's a dominant trait. And so it's quite likely for females to get it too. It's actually quite hard to tell X linked dominant patterns from normal dominant patterns because you do only need one copy. And of course, females will get one copy and show the condition. Uh, so it's a bit, bit trickier. And that was our little conversation on inheritance the other day. Hopefully that's a nice little refresher and it'll help you when you come to thinking about how achondroplasia and Alzheimer's and the other conditions we've been studying are in fact inherited. Hopefully that's of help.